So welcome. Um, I know many of you in the room, but for those of you I don't know, my name is Catherine Stoner. Uh, I'm a senior fellow here. I'm a political scientist. I work on uh, Russian politics too, and uh, I'm also the deputy director of the Freeman Spogli Institute. And it's my um, pleasure to welcome Sam Green and Graham Robertson to uh, Stanford. I don't think you guys have been here before, have you? So, right, I just excused the cold weather and they laughed <laughs> at that. Yeah, one forgets when one lives in paradise, I guess. Um, uh, they're here to speak as part of our Russian power and purpose in the 21st century, RPP 21, because we're in Silicon Valley um, program. Um, and they're going to talk about their new book, uh, which is Putin versus the People, which is conveniently enough on sale. Uh, another book about Russia that is red and blue and white. Uh, they're all, I, I noticed that that's what publishers are doing now, but it looks beautiful and it's really fabulous. Um, and we're very lucky to get them both um, out here. Um, Sam Green is sitting over here. Uh, he is a reader in Russian politics and director of the Russia Institute at King's College London. Uh, his research focuses on relationships between citizens and the state in Russia and in societies experiencing social, economic, and political transformation more broadly. His first book, Moscow in Movement, Power and Opposition in Putin's Russia, which I had the pleasure of reviewing, uh, was published by Stanford University Press in 2014, and it's fabulous and, and very interesting, um, very much worth reading. More recently, he, of course, has written this book, Putin versus the People, The Perilous Politics of a Divided Russia. Uh, which has just come out with Yale uh, in uh, the fall of 2019. Um, he's also an associate fellow in the Russian and Eurasian program of the International Institute for Security Studies. And I guess you've been a visiting professor at the UK Defense Academy. Um, sitting to my immediate left is Graham Robertson, who's a professor of political science at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And he's also the director for, of the Center for Slavic, Eurasian, and East European Studies. His work also focuses on political protest and regime support in authoritarian regimes. His um, book, of course, is uh, this one, published in 2019. And he's also uh, the author of a book uh, on um, uh, reform and revolution in um, Ukraine. Actually, is that's not a book. That's a paper, right? It's uh, policy. Right, memo, right, right. right. Um, and uh, a book on politics of protest in hybrid regimes. Managing Dissent in Post-Communist Russia that was published by uh, Cambridge University Press. Um, so I'm going to stop talking up all of their laur laurels and, and um, accomplishments and let them talk about their work. Um, so why don't you guys take it away? I'm going to turn my mic off and then we'll... Which means I should turn mine on. Yes, because we're recording. So. There we go. Um, thank you for that kind in introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here. It's great to see so many people uh, in the room, there's a lot of interest in Russia. Um, people always say to me, this is an interesting time to be interested in Russia. And I say, well, yeah, the last 30 years has been an interesting time to be interested in Russia. And um, uh, it's great, to, it's great that, that, that you uh, joined us today and, and invited Sam and I out. Um, what we try to do with this book uh, is what I think we've been trying to do with uh, our careers in general is to, is, to, is to sort of bridge two things at the same time. One is to uh, contribute to, to, to policy discussions, to the policy debate on Russia at a, at a really important time in the history of our relations with that country and at a time in which I think we, we make a lot of mistakes and we misunderstand things often. Um, and so we think that's an important uh, thing to try and do. Uh, and at the same time, contribute to the academic study of, of authoritarianism, which is something we're both uh, very heavily involved in. So this book tries to straddle two, two worlds, and, and sometimes I'm not sure if it falls in between them or if it, if it does so successfully. Um, but uh, you guys can be the, can be the judge uh, of that. Um, I want to talk about two elements of the book um, which we think are uh, important contributions to not just how we think about Russia, but how we think about authoritarian regimes in, in, in general. I, I sometimes use the term dictatorship to refer to authoritarian regimes. Um, it's, it's you know, not the most accurate term, but it's, but it's easy shorthand, so I might do that uh, as well. But essentially what we do in the book is we uh, turn on its head how scholars have typically thought about how authoritarian uh, regimes work. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, uh, as, we, as we go forward. Um, 
And then Sam will take it on and, and, and start talking more about the kind of what we think of as a MISO level of interaction or the interaction between the state and, and, and citizens at the level of, 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 of organizations. There's a few basic assumptions about how authoritarianism works in the world and how it works in Russia in particular uh, that underlie what we're, what, we're, what we're talking about. And I want to um, touch uh, on a few of those um, to, to get us started. Um, most of the academic writing on uh, authoritarian regimes is from a very top-down perspective. It's based on the idea that dictators rule by fear. They rule by intimidation. They rule by bribing people by, 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 by money. Um, and they rule by creating institutions that channel political activity away from uh, democratization and, and into uh, behaviors that actually paradoxically help to consolidate uh, authoritarian rule. Our perspective is really different from that. Um, our perspective is to look at the interaction of citizens in the state in authoritarian regimes, an interaction that goes both ways, top down from the regime and bottom up, uh, an interaction that is absolutely un 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 unequal, uneven, right? The state has way more cards uh, at its disposal, but a state that nonetheless is constrained by and responds to uh, initiatives from below and is operating in a political field uh, in which um, competition for political support actually matters. That's one of the central contentions of our book. Uh, it's the idea that public politics, even in Russia, actually matters. Uh, more specifically, it's the idea that popularity and regime support really matters. Uh, and much of our story that I'm going to tell you, that we're both going to tell you today, is about how that popularity is won, how it's maintained, and how one day uh, it might be lost. This is, of course, a controversial position. Uh, it's a position that not all scholars share, but many think that public politics and authoritarian regimes like Russia are just a sham. That after all, Putin's really just a horrible dictator. He rules through intimidation and violence. Uh, he's what uh, the investor Bill Browder calls a, a modern day Pablo Escobar. Um, and that really the way to understand Putin is, and, and, and politics in Russia is to think of the KGB operative in the Kremlin. Right? And it's true. Putin does sit at the top of a bloated and self-important repressive apparatus. He does control the ruling party, the banks, the parliament, most of the regional govern governors, television, and significant corners of the internet. Uh, moreover, to be clear, we're not saying that the regime does not use violence and intimidation. Critics of the regime are murdered. Current opposition leaders do shuttle in and out of prison on a fairly regular basis, often spending quite a long time there. Protests are very often banned. And protesters are often beaten up when they decide to protest anyway. Critics of the regime, large and small, are routinely harassed. And the Russian government responds very aggressively to perceived insults from, from around the world. All of that's true. Um, and it's important. And uh, um, it really is part of the world in which Russian politics takes place. But if you focus only on that, um, then you miss key features of how politics in Russia today actually works. You misunderstand how the country is likely to develop. Uh, and you misunderstand how um, we should interact with and, and, and respond to, uh, what, to events in Russia. And so I think Sam and I agree that it's absolutely critical to recognize that Russia is not a democracy. In fact, it's far from being a democracy. But nonetheless, the regime depends very heavily on popularity and depends on public opinion. And public popularity and public opinion play a really important role in shaping the political system as it moves forward. Why does popularity matter? Well, it's simple, really. The popularity matters because it's a much less expensive way to rule and to rule by coercion all the time. And it's much less risky. Canceling elections, doing a full blown in North Korea uh, in Russia would be a really difficult thing to achieve. It would encounter very significant uh, domestic resistance. Much easier then to use elections and to manipulate those elections uh, and use them as a device for legitimizing uh, authority and for staying in power. And winning elections, even manipulated elections, is just a lot easier if you're actually popular. Right? Moreover, popularity matters because it's, a, it's, it's, it's the main tool that Putin has uh, to get other leaders, businessmen, bankers, journalists, secret policemen, uh, generals, to actually follow him uh, and do his bidding. So long as Putin can credibly promise to be able to win elections without too much resistance from the people, then he can protect those whose power and wealth depend on the current system. And as long as the elite believes that Putin can protect them, then they'll continue to follow him. 
Should it one day look that he can no longer do this, then all bets are off. Uh, this a battle for succession would break out with really uncertain consequences. And so that's a, a major premise of the book, that one of the things that they are very uh, primarily concerned with is maintaining popularity. Another major premise of the book is that that popularity that they gain is not magicked up out of thin air, but has to be fought for, has to be won, has to be maintained. Uh, it doesn't just come out of some supposed natural longing on the part of the Russians for a strong hand. There is not a whole lot of evidence for that contention. Um, the support is conditional, uh, and it could go away. And so understanding those dynamics uh, are important, and they shape how the regime behaves in the world. Um, the way we normally understand popularity in, uh, in Russia in the academic literature is to think about it in terms of, of economic uh, performance. So Putin comes to power at the end of the 1990s. Um, the economy has, has been tanking for a decade. Uh, things are going really badly, and then he takes over, and things start to get better. Um, and as you can see on this on this graph, his popularity can I make it? No. Uh, his popularity is I start recording. His popularity shoots up very very quickly uh, into being above 60 percent, uh, and more or less stays that way with some with ups and few downs over the next 20 years. This data takes us right up into to, to January of, of, of this year. Uh, the economy, on the other hand, doesn't behave nearly so well. Um, this is uh, real GDP in Russia, according to the World Bank, over the last decade. And what you see is, you know, at the start of the decade, things were going pretty strongly. Russia then kind of sinks into stagnation and then sinks into a very deep recession and is only just now sort of slowly gathering out of it. So there's basically very little relationship over the last decade between Putin's popularity uh, and um, the economic performance. So this raises a question, and the question is, where does this popularity come from? Why is it so high, and how does it remain uh, in the, you know, in, 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 at, at extremely high levels? And that's what we talk about in the book. There's a number of elements to this, and I'll talk. About, I'll just sketch them very, very quickly. But the way we understand it is to really think about how politics and 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 and, and, and popularity has been studied in Western societies in democracies, and then think about what we can learn for the Russian context, changing what needs to be changed, changing the fact there's not a free press, changing the fact that politics is not a, a battle of different alternatives that have equal access. But nonetheless, the way that politics is constructed, there's things that we can learn from uh, the way politics has worked in the West. And there are things that the Putin administration has learned from how politics has worked in the West. And we talk about this in the book. One of those things is what we call wedge issues. One of the ways that the Putin regime reconstructed its power uh, after the public relations disaster, which was the transfer of, uh, that was Putin's return to the presidency in 2011, 2012, which as many of you will remember, produced uh, very high levels of protests at a time when, when Putin's popularity uh, was sinking. So you see around, around here, 2000, August 2011, 2012, was, his popularity is above 60%, but it's as low as it's been in, in his, his time in power. He then is able to build it back up and stabilize it at that level. And one of the ways they do it is by, is by dividing people, is by activating previously non-existent social cleavages, uh, turning people against each other on issues of morality and religion. Sound familiar? Should do. Um, in the Russian case, it was the Orthodox Church and, and, and LGBTQ rights, gay rights. Um, it was... Uh, taking issues that really no one had talked very much about in public politics in Russia at all, and making them front and central, and taking it the advantage of a lack of public information and a lack of public knowledge to turn politics into a game of 80-20, 80% the majority of so-called healthy, right-thinking, patriotic Russians, uh, and a minority of, of Western-influenced uh, defeat deviants. Right? That's, that's the strategy. It works. We've seen it before uh, in our own politics. So that's one of the ways that, that they do it. And we talk a bit, fair bit about that in the book. Um, but there are other elements to uh, the way P Putin's popularity is constructed that are a little bit different from the standard things that we usually think about. And I want to talk about two of those. One is about the role of personality, of individual personality, in shaping uh, support for the regime and in maintaining support for the regime. Uh, and then the other is collective experience, collective engagement in, 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 in politics, and really the, the politics of emotions. Um, let me say a little bit about each of them uh, in turn. On personality, 
Sam and I have been interested in popularity and support. Really, we, we both come from a protest and social movements background. So what we were really interested in is not who supports the regime, but who opposes the regime. This was the, the initial idea way back a decade ago. Um, and we asked lots of questions. We asked lots of you know, informed you know, uh, Russians, social scientists, lay people what they thought um, the, the sources were. And so we tried a lot of the ideas to do with whether you know, families had lived in Moscow for more than three generations, whether they had a background in the liberal intelligentsia, all these kinds of things. Um, most of that stuff didn't really work to explain patterns of support or opposition. But one thing that we found in the political psychology literature that was very powerful was the idea of, of personality psychology. This is the idea that people have underlying dispositions towards the world that shape their interaction with people around them and shape their interaction with, uh, with the world. That these dispositions are relatively few in number. You can actually classify them in a, in a way that's, that's, that's relatively useful. And they interact with the world in ways that are consistent and predictable and help you understand politics. There's a ton of different ways to do this. There's you know, more than a century of literature on this. Um, we focused on the most uh, well-validated, most uh, used way of understanding personality. It's something called the Big Five personality traits. They go by the acronym OCEAN. So that's openness, which captures the degree to which a person is open to new ideas or new experiences. Conscientiousness, which describes the degree to which a person places emphasis on order and rule following. Uh, extroversion, people who, who are outgoing and like to, like to go out. Uh, agreeableness, uh, which sort of captures the importance that people place on maintaining friendly and successful social relations with those around them. Uh, and then finally, neuroticism, which measures the extent to which someone is or is not anxious uh, and worried in their, in their daily interactions. Psychologists have found that with the partial exception of neuroticism, which I can tell you grows over the course of your life, <laughs> um, the rest are characteristics that are pretty stable, that are very acquired very early on in life. There are a mixture of genetics and, and, and early childhood experiences. Um, and we all we see this in, our under, in the way we interact with other people. We all know people who are more gregarious and who like to hang out with a group. We know people who, like to, who, who, who don't like that at all. We know people who like to try the new restaurant in town, and people who like to go to the same old place uh, every year, people who like conflict, and people like me who hide in their office to avoid it. Um, uh, we, we know these traits exist in the world, and we shape our, our behavior around uh, uh, taking them into account when we, when we deal with other people. Psychologists have found that those kinds of traits affect virtually everything in your life, from your life expectancy to whether you'll get married, who you'll get married, what kind of job you'll do, how successful you'll be in that job, and so on. Uh, th literally thousands of studies on this, on this subject, and politics is no exception. Most of the work on this has been done in, in Western contexts, and especially in the United States, and what it's found is that the traits of openness, so that's open, fully open to new experience, or conscientiousness, which is how, how much of a rule follower you are, is a pretty good predictor of where you fall on a liberal conservative scale and predicts that, that pretty well. Um, so when we take this to Russia, what do we find? Well, we find that conscientiousness actually does a pretty good job of explaining support for Putin and his policies. People who uh, like order, prefer order over, over disorder, or tend to be more supportive of Putin. We also find that oppositionists tend to be more neurotic uh, which, you know, what's the cause and what's the effect? Um, to my previous remarks about oppositions being harassed. Um, uh, but what we found that was most interesting in our study was something that had, had almost no attention in other studies of politics in, in the West, and that was that the trait of, a, of agreeableness. The desire to get on and maintain positive social relations with people was the single best predictor, as better than the economy, of the degree to which people supported the regime or did not support the regime. Um, moreover, they were also likely to support key policies of the regime, including uh, Putin's campaign against the LGBTQ community. Um, now, it's really interesting because agreeable people, according to Western research, tend to be warm. They tend to be kind. They tend to be e empathetic. So how come they end up being racist and homophobic in Russia in ways that, that they're not in the, in the, in the and they're less so uh, in the West? Um, so this is interesting, right? And deep, digging deeper into this, what we, what we found was that agreeableness is not just a measure of uh, how much people want to fit in, but it's also a measure of how people actively sh try and shape their behavior in order to fit in, what psychologists call effortful control of frustration. So highly agreeable people are willing to put up with a lot 
and make a really hard effort you know, and attempt to try and be one of the group, be one of the, one of the gang. Um, and what we found was that there's this group of people who really want to be part of the community who are really at the core of food and support. And we describe in the book how this works. We describe how people who are higher on agreeables watch more state television, they go to church more, and they're um, much more open to the kinds of messages that they think are, 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 are resonating well in society. And they get that information not just from TV, although TV is really important, but they get that information from the church, they get that information from their boss, uh, they get that information from the schools. They get that information from, from their social uh, surroundings um, that, 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 that exist in contemporary Russia. And it's that social construction of support and the appearance of support that's absolutely fundamental to, to, to Putin's popularity and he maintains it at such high levels. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing I want to talk about, and I've talked too long already, but is, 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 is about emotions. Um, most of the work that's gone on on authoritarian regimes looking at emotions looks at fear and the extent to which the regime making you afraid to protest, afraid to oppose uh, the regime or, or a big role that plays. Um, but if you look at Russian politics or you look at Chinese politics or you look at Turkish politics, um, fear is not at all the only thing that drives support for authoritarianism. There's, a, there's genuine, genuine enthusiasm, there's genuine engagement, there's genuine emotion driving things forward. And to demonstrate that that's true in Russia, we look at the events surrounding the annexation of Crimea uh, in, 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 in 2014. We conducted a survey of what's called a panel survey, where you ask the same people the same questions over time. And we asked questions in October 2013, before the annexation of Crimea, then we organized the revolution in Ukraine and the annexation, uh, and then asked the same people the questions afterwards in June 2014. Um, in, in social science, it's really important to be lucky, um, well and good. Um, and what we saw was um, a transformation in uh, how people responded to the regime that, that occurred around that period. In the book, we interview Leonid Volkov, who's one of the leading uh, oppositionists in Russia. Volkov describes the annexation of Crimea as this magic bean from like a Super Mario Brothers game. Uh, Putin eats the bean and it gives him more energy and recharges his battery and, and keeps, the, keeps him going on for, for, for an extra number of years. Um, and Crimea is definitely like that, um, but it's much more than that. Um, uh, what happens in Crimea is uh, um, an opportunity to, to really study the interaction, how this, um, this boost that Putin got in his popularity, you can, there's no prizes for guessing where the re revolution in Ukraine takes place in, 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 this, in this map, um, the annexation of Crimea. Putin gets this huge boost, um, but he gets more than just a huge boost in popularity. This is our survey respondents. Um, you can't actually see the light blue panels at all. I should have checked that. But the numbers are there at least. Putin gets a huge boost in, in, in approval. Those that somewhat approve and completely approve of him uh, before and after Crimea. You, you can see it better on, maybe if you're further away, you can see yeah, it better than I can. Um, <laughs> but it's not just approval, it's pride. This was before, the dark blue is before. How proud are you of the way Russia has governed? Uh, basically nobody is proud of how Russia has governed before Crimea. Afterwards, uh, more than a third of people, towards a half of people, are, are, are genuinely very proud of how Russia has governed. Um, it's trust. How much do you trust uh, Russia's leaders? Well, not at all. Before Crimea, afterwards, you know, a lot. Um, it's hope. Does the way Russia has governed give you hope for the future? We're all hopeless before Crimea. We're full of hope afterwards. Um, it's a whole range of different different things. Really interestingly though, it's also some other things. It's not nationalism. It's not that Crimea makes people more nationalistic. We asked questions of how important is the Russian state to your identity? It's important before Crimea, it's important after Crimea. It makes very, very little difference um, to how people feel about uh, their nation. Um, but then there's some other weird things that start to happen. People become more optimistic about things. They don't, it's not that they feel more Russian or more patriotic. They just feel better, you know? Is the economy, how do you expect the Russian economy to perform over the next three years? The proportion saying it's going to get better, uh, you know, increases by more than a half. Um, how about corruption? Do you think high level corruption is a problem in Russia? Before Crimea, uh, it's a very serious problem. Afterwards, not so serious, right? So the annexation of Crimea solves corruption. There we go, and now we know how to do that. Uh, and it's not just high level corruption, it's uh, street cops as well. Low-level corruption improves dramatically according to people's opinions. Uh, 
before and after Crimea. Uh, and then the most magical thing of all, um, the past gets better too. Um, Crimea fixes the past. People, how did your family do in the, in, in the 1990s? Well, most of us did worse. And now all of a sudden we remember things a little bit better than, than, than we did in the past. Right? Things get better. So what explains all of that stuff? And well, long story short, what explains it is, is, is engagement. What explains it is people's interaction with each other. People who talk about politics more experience these improvements in emotions much more than anybody else. People who watch TV news more uh, feel these things much more than anybody else. People who engage in general with the political regime and with the political moment all start feeling a lot better about everything. And they get, they get kind of wrapped up in this, in this moment of, uh, of effervescence, of collective effervescence that, uh, that lasts for Putin for, for four years, which is, which is unprecedented in the history of these kinds of, uh, of events. I'm going to stop there. OK. Great. Um, well, thanks. Uh, I, um, thank you again uh, for the opportunity to, to be here. And, and thanks, Graham, for um, setting that up. I'll say a couple more things, uh, but then hopefully uh, open this up to, uh, to conversation. Can you hear me? I don't even know if this is on. Um, OK, great. Um, so um, what Graham is, is, is describing right, um, is uh, part of this fundamental um, argument that we're making, again, as he said, not just about Russia, but about authoritarianism. Uh, uh, in general, uh, and if we're thinking about w how power operates in these sorts of environments, um, that we talk about in a way that it's, it's co-constructed. We talk about, there's a big argument in the book about uh, the co-construction of, of power in Russia, and we think um, in, in authoritarian environments more uh, broadly. And one of the implications of this co-construction argument, right, the idea that it's, it's not just created by the regime from the top down, but that there is a, uh, a mutual element to this is that it shifts the e emphasis in explaining authoritarian power away from structure and back, maybe not entirely, but at least a bit towards more agent or agency centric um, explanations. Right? So in our story, the decisions that people make and importantly, the interpretations that people have of those decisions and of the ensuing actions and, and reactions matter as much as or more than uh, what we might see as structural elements of the state-society relationship, such as the, the long-term relationship between economic performance and support, or elements of culture or history or other less dynamic, less human, and less social factors. Right. So to, to tell a couple of, of brief stories about this, in 2011, a man named Timur Prokopienko was given a job in the Russian presidential administration that had never existed before. It was the job of curator of online media. Right. So the Kremlin had long tasked various officials with looking after important parts of the political landscape, parties, governors, major cities, and of course, broadcast and print media. For television in particular, the administration convened regular meetings and had really since Putin came to power of the heads of the various news services handing out instructions, what they called in Russian timniki, um, uh, or topic sheets, right? Explaining what was to be covered and how, but also what was to be ignored uh, and, and how, right? It wasn't until 2011 though that the, the Kremlin decided that the internet was important enough and challenging enough to warrant a curator of its own. Now, Prokopienko had been a rising star in the pro-Putin uh, youth organizations that the administration began assembling after the Orange Revolution uh, in Ukraine. And one of the, the many um, uh, brain children of, of Vladislav Surkov, if you're following the news, who was fired today. Um, uh, he was uh, uh, barely 31 years old when he got the job, leaving a seat in the Duma to which he'd been elected only a few months earlier. To help run his shop, uh, he, he called on uh, a friend from his youth organizing days, a woman named uh, Kristina Potupchik, who had been uh, a press secretary in Nashi, another youth, Russian youth organization you may have come across, um, uh, and then had become a private PR consultant after, after leaving that. Right, together, they understood that achieving their task, quote unquote, winning the internet right, for the Kremlin, would be different than winning TV or winning elections. So coercion, control, and so-called administrative resources would not, uh, not only not suffice, right, but they could be counterproductive. Now, we know this, and the book describes this, not just because Prokopienko and Potupchik are particularly talkative, uh, but because uh, a hacker group called Sheltai Baltai, which is the Russian name for Humpty Dumpty, uh, fished Prokopenko's emails um, and uh, put the contents out there for the world to see WikiLeaks style. 
right? Um, turnabout is fair play, I guess. Um, uh, this gives us an inside view into how Potupchik uh, managed a network of self-identified guardians. Uh, the Russian term is okhranitili. Uh, who went to battle daily on social media, blogging platforms, uh, media comment boards, uh, and elsewhere against the Kremlin's various uh, opponents. What we see is a picture, uh, not of a, of a well-oiled manipulation machine, right, but of a community of state and state-linked actors who understand themselves to be contestants in, in, in really a very highly contested field. They're committed to their cause, some for love, others for money, of course. Um, uh, uh, but they, and, and they do of course have a, a, a very powerful state apparatus on their side, right? But they never seem all that confident of, of victory. Now in, in the book, we, we look at, at more than 150 strategy reports that Potupchik writes over a four month period in 2014. Uh, and we see a, an experimental responsive process of engagement that in many ways resembles sort of the way they used uh, wedge issues in, in a trial and error process in, in 2012, right? So uh, at one point, Potupchik joins in sort of Putin's Russia is not Europe campaign, right? Um, on this sort of family, uh, family values uh, campaign. She initially encourages the Okhranitili to use the, the tag gay ropa, right? Um, um, I don't have to explain. I think that the smiles around the table indicate that you know where that comes from, but she quickly backs off of it uh, because it becomes a way to, to ridicule the Okhranitili the, the for simple mindedness. Right? Um, instead, uh, many of Potutrik's stratagems focus on, on obfuscation and misdirection. Right? So she passes out uh, messages accusing Dorst and other independent media sources of being in the pocket of foreign governments. She tries to undermine um, uh, numerous corruption uh, investigations uh, by Alexei Navalny and his team uh, by claiming it's just sour grapes over their failure in another election and, and so on. Right? To dampen enthusiasm for the anti-war movement, that emerged in the spring of, uh, and summer of 2014, Potupchik suggests a whole bar, a barrage of attacks, right? The, the, the Akhraniti should claim that most of the protesters come from the LGBTQ community, uh, that they are working on behalf of foreign interests, uh, and that they are doing the dirty work of that well-known fascist Petro Poroshenko, as of course you would expect from the LGBT community. So cognitive dissonance is, is part of this process. As the Akhraniti panicked, over the massive ruble devaluation in 2014, though it was caused by Western sanctions, Potupchik fretted in her reports that it's impossible for her, for her to do her job right, if the Russian finance ministry and central bank won't do theirs. Um, and in fact, alongside these messages to the regime supporters online, giving them instructions, uh, uh, including essentially a never ending stream of ideas about how to demoralize and demotivate uh, supporters of the opposition. Potupchik's emails contain numerous <laughs> pleas for the government to stop getting in the way. In particular, she and Prokopienko pushed back against efforts by some in the presidential administration and the security services and in the Duma to control the internet more tightly. Such efforts, she wrote, not only made it harder to get messages across to fence sitters right, and gave fodder to the opposition, they even risked alienating the Okhranitili themselves, right, the, the regime's own allies, many of whom resented the heavy handed incursions into spaces they considered their own, not least the sort of the BitTorrent sites where they and the opposition shared a common interest in downloading private content. Um, in other words, right, what we see is an organization that struggles to resolve the same framing challenges and resource mobilization challenges that contestants face in classical social movement theory. Right? Uh, on some level, this shouldn't be surprising. Right? We know from that same classical social movement theory that incumbents have to do this kind of thing too. It's not just a challenge for challengers. But it's unusual and instructive, I think, to conceive of authoritarian regimes in this, uh, in this way. Another example of how this uh, works uh, and, and why I, I think it's instructive comes from the Kremlin's relationship with the movement that would grow up in support of the separatists in Eastern Ukraine. Right? Um, a somewhat imprecise way of putting it because of course this movement was there before uh, the war in Eastern Ukraine. So for the book, we looked at 16 um, of the largest uh, public community pages uh, involved with the Donbass conflict on the Russian social networking site VK, essentially a Russian analog of, of Facebook, except with a much bigger user base in, in Russia. At their peak, these communities were seeing something like 6 million likes per month um, and nearly a, a million 
uh, more content rich, so, so posts and comments, uh, uh, interactions uh, every month. We trace these groups back to their origins, however, and that takes us back at least as far as December 2011, right? Um, and their roots in, in what is, of course, a longstanding nationalist movement uh, in Russia. Now, prior to the Euromaidan, prior to Crimea, and prior to the war in Donbass, these groups talked about what you would expect them to talk about, right? So they talked about Russia's greatness, about religion, about the Great Patriotic War, about Stalin, uh, about Soviet nostalgia. Every once in a while, they talked about the nefarious West. Uh, what they didn't talk about very much was Putin, right? Uh, for the, the, the fairly simple reason that they didn't see Putin as being one of them, right? So sure, Putin had made Russia great again, right? Um, but he'd also sanctioned the arrests of numerous nationalist leaders. Uh, he allowed the FSB to hound nationalist groups around the country. He'd pursued and defended visa-free regimes with Central Asia. Uh, he allowed uncontrolled migration from the North Caucasus into uh, the quote-unquote Russian heartland, uh, and, and so on. He was not an ally uh, of this movement. Um, the Euromaidan changed that, right? So, Putin had been present in about 5% of the posts in these groups prior to late 2013. By March 2014, he was in 34%. Um, Ukraine, of course, was in 78% of the posts that, that month, for a while even outstripping mentions of Russia uh, itself in these Russian nationalist groups. And with the spike uh, of interest in, in Ukraine, we also see a spike in the presence of, of the ways that the Kremlin talked about the conflict, particularly on television. So in terms of fascism, pushing back against liberal values, um, uh, even LGBT um, uh, references, and of course references to the idea of revenge. Right. So this sudden consonance, right, both within the movement, this nationalist movement, which had been rather cacophonous before, and between the movement uh, and the Kremlin, right, comes alongside uh, a, a really uh, significant shift in how the nationalists interacted with the media. Right? So prior to Crimea and the Donbass, nationalist groups on social media were as likely to share articles and videos from oppositional news sources right, uh, as they were from state-linked and, and, and pro-Kremlin news sources, right? and in many cases more likely to interact with oppositional media. Uh, again, Crimea changed that. Right? So by 2014, official or state-linked news outlets accounted for nearly half uh, of the top 10 sources, four out of the top 10 sources uh, of materials shared by the nationalist VK groups, up from essentially uh, zero. Right? This was not because the movement had suddenly become <laughs> friendly to the state. Right? It was because the state was finally doing what the movement had been asking them to do all along, namely putting the force of arms right, behind the defense of Russian-speaking communities outside of Russia's borders. Right. And when the state stopped doing that, or stopped doing that at least as robustly as the movement would have liked, putting its weight behind the Minsk Accords, um, uh, reining in separatist leaders such as, as Girkin or Strelkov or Zerharchenko, eventually pushing Dugin back into his, his shadowy corner of, of, of Russian politics, uh, the consensus rapidly dissipated. So by 2016, state-linked sources had dropped out of the VK groups almost entirely, replaced by a new ecosystem of of uh, media uh, sites that the movement itself began to, to create, which not infrequently criticized um, uh, the Kremlin's uh, allegedly milquetoast approach to the war. Again, the movement's perspective, not, not my perspective, certainly not Ukraine's perspective. We tell this story, of course, in a lot more detail in the book, not simply to make the point that you know, Putin is a nationalist, uh, is, uh, is somewhat less than a straightforward story. What we're trying to do is to complicate the, 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 the idea that Putin is in complete control, right? That even in something as critical and strategic as the war in Donbass, and even given the resources that the Kremlin can throw at these things, it's evident just how much work right, the Kremlin has to do to stay in control of the agenda, even with its own allies. Right? Uh, and even then, its success is less than complete, right? So taken together with the story of, of Potupchik and, and the Okhranitili, we have uh, a process uh, that is rich in, in agents, um, rich in their interpretations, and that cannot easily be explained unless we understand the ways in which multiple contesting actors right, shape one another's behavior. Um, which takes us, and I'll wrap up in a, in, in a second, uh, which takes us to, to the one group we haven't really discussed yet, which of course is the opposition. Right? Graham mentioned uh, a bit. Um, uh, in the book, despite the fits that that the opposition gives to people like Fatubchik, um, uh, the opposition is very much on the back foot. 
right? Um, struggling to deal with this magic bean, right? That, that Leonid Volkov um, uh, is, is talking about. Um, and, and to persuade disaffected Russians, not that Russia is poorly governed, everybody pretty much understands that, but that someone other than Putin might actually govern it better. Right? Um, at the moment, it feels as though that picture may have shifted. So if you remember the graph of, of, of Putin's support, I'm not going to flip back in the, in the slides, right? The, the, um, the magic bean does eventually wear off, right? Um, and, um, uh, and, 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 and so Putin's approval ratings clearly are not where they once were, although they're not exactly catastrophically low uh, either. Right? Um, opposition remains uh, uh, galvanized. Uh, mostly around uh, Navalny, but unlike previous uh, periods um, and structures, it's showing both a remarkable ability, at least by Russian standards, to generate new leaders and for those leaders to actually coexist. I think I was going to say get along. Uh, that might be a bit of a stretch, right? But they, they do manage to, to coexist. Over the past 12 to 18 months, uh, various parts of what we might loosely refer to as, as the opposition movement have shown an increased capacity to mobilize supporters in the face of increasingly severe and increasingly violent repression. What's striking to me, though, is, uh, is how radically the Kremlin's approach to the opposition and, in fact, to the population as a whole has shifted um, in the few months since the book came out, unfortunately. Um, it, it, so it's not only the violence, right, that is, that is puzzling, especially after the, the Kremlin so studiously avoided violence for most of the 2011-2012 protest wave. We need an explanation for the bizarre rollout of Putin's constitutional reform, if we want to call it that, right? The, the, the speech that was broadcast almost on the side of every major building in, 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 in major cities, the spectacular publicity with which it was announced, and the spectacularly anti-public manner in which is being implemented, right? So you call together a committee of 75 or 77 people to draft the, the, uh, uh, the constitutional reform. You submit the constitutional reform to the Duma before the committee has a chance to meet. Sounds a bit like my university, right? But not usually, you know, not what was promised on television. Uh, the Duma will pass it, Putin will sign it, and then they will hold a public vote to ratify Putin's signature. So it's, um, it's, it, 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 it needs some sort of an explanation, right? Um, it's possible that the presidential administration's skills in managing public opinion have atrophied uh, to a certain degree. Prokopienko, Potupchik, uh, even Surkov, right, have been replaced by uh, a newfound emphasis on coercion uh, and, and control. And the competitive spirit, um, of course, not entirely democratically competitive spirit, but the competitive spirit of people like Surkov or Gleb Pavlovsky before him uh, have decidedly uh, left the building. Also, I suppose, possible that the Kremlin is purposefully uh, devaluing institutions, including the Constitution, uh, in, the, in the public imagination. I don't think we yet have a satisfying answer to these questions. Um, but both observations, uh, both about the Kremlin, uh, uh, about the, the, the changing contours of the opposition, and about the changing approaches of the Kremlin to that opposition, uh, point, I think, uh, to the value in the concept of, of, of co-construction. Right. The idea that, that, that these two things are, are mutually constituted, that they come together to shape, to enable, and to limit power in Russia. And I will stop there. Great. So Emily has a uh, microphone back there. Um, if anyone wants to ask a question, she will bring uh, the microphone over. Um, well, you're thinking up your questions. Maybe I'll ask one. Um, so this is fascinating, and, and thank you guys uh, for for coming out. It seems like the, I mean, the scope of the book is both political psychology and then also um, public opinion and then public mobilization. So um, since they, since there's so much effort uh, at trying to craft these high approval ratings, and since they the, the regime needs it, um, needs high approval ratings to, um, especially Putin, to, to maintain stability. What, what do you make of the newest um, trust polls that have come out, which, you know, you're showing us approval, which is, is still relatively high in the new polls, too, as you're showing here. But trust in Putin has gone down since the announcement of these constitutional mm -hmm. changes. So... Um, so that's one question. What do you make of that? And the second is, um, what's behind the speed of the constitutional changes? Uh, it, you know, so much effort goes into 
uh, as you described, crafting public opinion, right, and interacting with it and, um, and finding wedge issues to exploit. Um, what is he so worried about? Uh, that he needs to do this so quickly. He's been pretty effective. I mean, he's still up over, mm -hmm. you know, hovering around 70% yeah, even now. Again. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'll stop. Long question. Yeah. Can I take the easy one and give you the hard one? <laughs> that's, that's, I'm that's... not sure which is which. <laughs> well, the trust one seems to me to be easier. So the, 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 the trust polls that, that, that we saw were really, really, for me, very exciting because, in part, because we had asked the same questions. Um, and what we see is those numbers are much more uh, they move much more than the approval numbers do over time. And they also move at a lower level, right? So there's a kind of whole kind of intercept shift down. Um, and what that tells, tells me is that you're know, part of the, 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 the challenge, and Sam actually mentioned this for opposition in Russia, is not to point out that Russia is poorly governed, but to point to create the idea that it could be better governed under somebody else. And that's, that's that second part of the story that's a really hard sell. And so it's perfectly compatible with high approval ratings for Putin as the person who's going to be president of Russia and for his trust ratings to, to, to fall. And I would like to see, you know, this, this, this seems to me to be the kind of, this really is the end of uh, the magic bean has finally worn off. And that's what these falling, because what they've fallen, they've fallen back to kind of the sort of levels that they were at in the surveys that we did before uh, Crimea. You think back to, to, to what was going on there, and then you had a, had a regime that was on the back foot very significantly politically. That was, that, that this, this was the period in which the wedge issues came out and where they were trying to mobilize, where they were basically giving up on being you know, president of the whole nation and, and settling for president of the majority of the nation. And I think, I think that is some, mm -hmm. something of what we see in the strategy that that, 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 that we've seen with the constitutional changes and the, uh, and, and, and the, the much harsher crackdown that we've seen uh, in recent, in the last 18 months or so. Um, so I think that actually flows into the answer for the, for, for the second question, which is that you know, the last time the Kremlin was in this situation, right, it was throwing massive amounts of stuff at the wall and hoping that some of it would stick, right? And some of the wedge issues did stick, and they stuck to the extent that they stopped the bleeding. But they didn't create a new surge in, in support. Even the Olympics in Sochi, massively successful, did not create a new surge in support. The World Cup, even more successful by some measures, um, certainly um, in terms of, of non-doping related Russian sporting performance, right, um, uh, was more successful and, um, uh, and did not prevent uh, approval ratings were falling, right, um, beginning to fall in the, in, in the summer um, uh, that year. And so um, I think the, the Kremlin, uh, maybe because of, of a lack of, of talent, but I think possibly because of a lack of, of, of just social traction, right, has been struggling to find a way to, uh, to turn these sorts of numbers around, right. Um, and um, that uh, of course, there's some economic reasons for that as well. We've had five or six now declining years of, of uh, years of declining real disposable uh, incomes. Right, uh, in, incomes in, in real terms are are now as much as 10 percent uh, below where they were uh, before Crimea. Right, and that is inevitably going to have a political price uh, somewhere. So, along with the constitutional reforms about power, we have constitutional reforms about you know, enshrining um, uh, in, indexation of, of, of pensions and other social spending. Um, into the budget, uh, raising the minimum wage, and so on. Um, but um, one of the things that Graham mentioned at the outset right, is this question of why does an authoritarian ruler want these, these numbers? Why do they pay attention to these polls? Right? I think because there is a substitution effect between uh, popularity and, uh, and coercion and control. Right? Um, Putin, uh, when he looks at something like the Euromaidan, right, what's scary to him, I think, is not that you've got um, uh, half a million Ukrainians out on the streets, right? That happens periodically, right? Uh, but that uh, the, the rapidity with which Yanukovych loses control of his elite, right? And he understands fundamentally that the immediate challenge, right, uh, to him is, is from the elite, right? But this is a tool for managing the elite, right? If this tool is no longer working, right, um, uh, because it no longer demonstrates to the elite that Putin is firmly in control of the situation in the country and can guarantee their position and power and privilege uh, in the country, then he needs something else, right? Um, I think that's part of the explanation for the, the turn towards uh, coercion, right? That the state would not 
uh, under Putin uh, uh, failed to have the courage of its convictions when it came to defending its stability on the streets. And so we saw something like 2,500 arrests um, uh, last summer uh, in, in, in Moscow and more uh, if you uh, count smaller protests around the country. Um, we just saw the, uh, the verdicts in the state case. We've seen uh, the network case. We've seen um, uh, pretty harsh verdicts handed down for people involved in, in, in last summer's protests as well. Right? Uh, I think the, the, um, um, uh, the constitutional reforms are of a kind with that. They're not, overly, they're not overtly repressive, right? but they are about communicating with the elite. Right? Uh, and the message um, uh, to the elite is really one of, of further complication, right? telling people that, that, that there are multiple now potential um, uh, configurations of power. Um, post-2024, uh, giving people no predictability whatsoever about what that power is going to look for. So look like, so if, if, if you were in the elite trying to think about your post-2024 future, you had to uh, sort of answer the question of who's going to be in charge, Putin or not Putin, right? Now you have to answer the question not only who's going to be in charge, but where they're going to sit, what the implications institutionally of that are. It's a much harder uh, calculation. Um, if you're in the elite and you might have a stake in that post-2024 future, then you might want to influence the process of constitutional change, right? Um, so if you're Putin, you want to make sure that process is not influenceable and, 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 and speed, I think, uh, uh, falls, uh, falls into that. Uh, it's a hypothesis. I mean, it, it, uh, answering that question requires access to research subjects that we can't access. Uh, okay, I see Alice and then Anna. Okay, this is following, oh, I guess I need a mic. Oh, here. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, thanks so much, Sam and Graham. That was fantastic. Um, so my question is following up on this speech and the announcement of uh, constitutional reforms. And of course, that was only the very end of the speech. And um, most of it was about social policy and uh, maternal capital, education, raising minimum wage, pension, and so on. Um, do you see these as a means to placate the people and um, make them think that things are going to get better as a way to distract from coercion? Do you think there's any possibility of these things actually coming true? Or are, is it just, um, again, the type of announcement uh, that fits into the trend of political rhetoric that people like to hear but know has no possibility of actually coming true? or being implemented. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that, that's what struck me about the speech as well, was, was we, we talked about, and, and, and actually, if you go back to Putin's annual addresses for, for years, he mostly talks about social policy and spending, you know, and, and, and it's these long laundry lists of all of these different programs and teachers' salaries and, and all this stuff. And, and, and that, to me, signals a, a, a couple of things. One is this is a regime which was born in the t first decade of this you know, the, of the 2000s. And, and what was that decade? Well, that decade was five, six, seven, eight percent economic growth. It was, it was, you know, Russia and the economy booming and Putin's popularity booming with it. And that's what, that's kind of like their, the lesson they learned from the beginning. So they would much rather do that. They would much rather have liberal ec economic relations with the West. Um, they would then, then do all of this Europa stuff. And, 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 and I think it's just, is not really, this is not their preferred strategy, but it's the strategy that they fell back on following the global financial crisis. They would love to get back to a situation in which the Russian economy was booming. But to do that, what they need to overcome is a problem that we've all understood for a long time, which is that the, those at the very top have the incentive to steal as much as they can while making sure everyone below them is as honest as they can be, right? And, and, and that's the way that the economy will grow and the property rights are secure, except when I decide to violate them. Uh, and those kinds of situations. And that's just not, it's not, it's not easy to do, right? Um, and instead, they've ended up in a situation where property rights are, 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 are weak, where corruption is rampant, uh, and where economic performance really has a, has a pretty hard ceiling. And now, you know, for, for international reasons, there, there's also a fairly hard ceiling on what economic growth would be like. And so I, I see the appointment of the, of the new uh, prime minister as being, he's sort of the, out of a pretty pretty thin picking is the most successful technocrat lying around. Um, uh, and and that's, that's definitely the, the strategy. I, I think there are really, you know, we often have underestimated the Russian economy. Um, I've, you know, been hearing predictions that the Russian economy is about to collapse for my whole career. Um, it hasn't done so yet. It probably isn't going to. Um, on the other hand, I, you know, I chose the, the language of ceilings to growth pretty consciously. I think um, you know, the, 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 the old days of five plus percent growth a year are definitely the old days and, and that's going to be very, very hard to, to, to get back to. Uh, 
Uh, and, but you can introduce yourselves too. Yep, and I see I, Rose. I'm Anna Schwab, so I'm, I'm faculty here. Um, so thank you for a fantastic uh, presentation. I was just wondering, you know, so Graham, you identified you know personality and agreeableness and those traits as sort of you know the structural uh, material with which the support is built. And Sam, you talked about sort of you know co-construction as sort of this agency sort of action-driven way of creating support. So I'm wondering what the relationship between those two are, right? What's sort of, you know, what's the relation? Is it uh, are they complements? Are they substitute? Do the two reinforce each other? What's the relationship between co-construction on the one hand and these sort of you know structural building blocks of personality traits and collective experiences? Um, so we certainly see these as 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 parts of the same story, right? Um, I, I think that you know we try to describe it a little bit as looking at the sort of the the, the micro and the meso level most. Authoritarian studies focusing really on the macro level and the, re the, re the regime level. I think the um, uh, if if you want to understand why the kind of stuff happening at the at the um, meso level, sort of the interactions online uh, between organizations, between the regime and and the opposition in the streets, matter, right? It's because of understanding the importance of these of these individual level uh, factors that are going on. And I think one of the things I, I will admit to having been very skeptical when we started this project, looking at at the um, the, the 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 personality uh, uh, traits argument in particular, I think, because I didn't initially understand where the um, the social aspect of it was, right? Uh, until in fact we came, we found uh, to our surprise, because I think to the literature's surprise, uh, this uh, the role of of agreeableism, which is something that, that hadn't really agreeableness, which hadn't been been, been present in in the argument before. Um, because one of the things that that points to, right, um, is that social context matters tremendously. Right? Um, that what is um, making uh, agreeableness function in this way in Russia, right, is not the structure of the Russian psyche or the Russian soul or something about Russian culture or history or different genetics and upbringing in uh, in Russia, right? It's a different um, uh, social political context uh, in Russia, right, in which difference and dissent are treated differently, have different consequences. Um, that does, of course, we're not saying that regime structure and, and institutions don't matter. These things, of course, do matter and that, that they structure that environment, right? Um, but that the that environment is, is um, incentivizing uh, um, uh, certain kinds of people to behave in certain kinds of ways, right, that then has uh, knock-on consequences for the furthering of of, of, of politics. One of the reasons that we do seem to see, you know, these, uh, uh, you know, rapid shift, you know, up in, in, um, uh, in uh, support and, and emotionally driven support, but then an equally rapid uh, 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 decline, right? It's because people aren't just looking at their individual relationship with Putin and thinking, do I trust Putin, right? This is a this is a social process. Right? If they're if they're feeling uh, that their position on Putin or trust or support or pride is changing, right? It's because something is changing in their reading of the situation around them, right? Uh, and and the feelings and emotions and attachments and connections of the of the people around them, right? And so we would expect this movement to to happen in groups, right? But if we want to understand why it does happen in groups and lumps and um, uh, and, and and waves, right? Then I think we need to understand that. Um, uh, that socially mediated relationship between the individual level and, 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 and the meso level. Does that make sense? If I could just add a, a little thing to the end of that. The, the, this sort of, you know, we, we think of public opinion as being an individual level thing. That's where we've studied it. What we think is that we've found it is it's not, right? It's, just a, it's a very significant degree of collective thing. It's about collective experience and how people process that collective experience. That is really dangerous from the perspective of the regime because as popularity can go up, very rapidly when, 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 when everyone is agreeing that, that we're heading in the right direction, it can also go down very rapidly. Um, and this explains, I think, to a significant degree, the unraveling of authoritarianism. When authoritarian regimes collapse, they were always surprised. Right? And it happens overnight, and, and we have various ad hoc stories about why, why that is. I think what we have here is one of the actual underlying features is that there is a lot of people out there who are looking around for the social signals about what is acceptable, what's the right, what's the patriotic thing to do. And when that changes, it's, it's really, really dangerous for, for, for authoritarians like, like Putin. Uh, Rose, I don't know. 
Thank you. I'm Rose Gottemuller. Sam, great to see you. And Graham, a warm welcome. I loved your uh, your phrase, Sam, collective effervescence after Crimea. I think that's that's really a, a wonderful expression. Yeah, from Graham. Um, my question has to do with whether you've made any comparisons back to the Soviet era, because what has interested me very much in watching this phenomenon in Russia of you know mass approval. The uh, you explain it very well with your notion of agreeableness, but. But in the Soviet era, uh, there was a certain sophistication about reading propaganda. There was a certain uh, satire and sarcasm, the Russian joke culture, uh, Soviet joke culture to serve as a safety valve, so to say, for, for people um, in trying to get their head around their Soviet world. And it has surprised me a bit that there seems to have been a certain uh, a certain lack of that in this in this period that that kind of uh, more or less cynical approach or or uh, uh, I'll put it this way in a more positive light acute observation of their political world an ability to have some safety valves to comment in their kitchens about it uh, to deal with it among themselves privately but nevertheless yes on the public stage to go along to get along to to be agreeable so i just wondered uh, it, it has surprised me that everybody seems to have, have swallowed this all lock stock and barrel and that that previous uh, more nuanced approach has, has seemed ac absent at least looking in from the outside so i wonder if you see it the same way we we didn't um thanks for the question it's it's, it's a great question we, we didn't look specifically and it's, it's hard to, to you know to, to to do a rigorous comparisons of that kind we did um draw some inspiration from Václav havel right uh, and his description of the, of, of the green grocer right um and in terms of understanding and interpreting how this this factor of agreeableness in particular is um is is working right this idea that that it is important for people to feel like they're living in social harmony and that creates uh, a, a reserve of, of durability for the system. Um, but um, uh, more broadly, I think there's, when it comes to, to satire and humor, that's certainly there. You know, we did, the last round of interviews we did was in early 2018, just before the presidential election. Um, we uh, found almost nobody who was planning on voting for anybody other than Putin. This was not a representative sample, but just a, a group of sort of qualitative interviews. Um, but nobody who thought that he was doing a particularly good job running the country. Right? One person who said he felt like he was living in the Truman Show, right? um, and yet he was going to vote as though he was in the Truman Show. So there is this reflection. If you've seen, if you haven't seen it, Google it. Um, there's this, this YouTube video making the rounds of, of, of uh, a social experiment where somebody posted a, a portrait of Putin in, in an elevator, right, uh, in, a, in a Russian apartment building, right, and you see a, a range of, of responses to that um, uh, as well, right. So there is um, a degree of, of separation. I think there is some other research that we're looking at, right. So Paul Good has an article from a couple of years ago um, uh, showing that um, a very interesting response to, to, to propaganda and, and patriotism, right? Uh, in a nutshell, that um, uh, everybody is aware that there's propaganda out there, right? Um, everybody assumes that everybody else is taken in by it, right? Um, but they are not themselves, right? So there is a, a separation of, of, of self and other interpretation that is consistent with kind of a, a generally atomized um, a picture that we have of, of Russia. So people are having these conversations, but they're having them in, in safe environments rather than in, um, in, in, in public environments, which allows them to form strong understandings of the opinions of people close to them, right? Uh, but fairly weak understandings of the distribution of opinion in the country as a whole. So one of the things we did find in the survey is that um, regardless of, of, of whether people were planning on voting for Putin or not voting for Putin, right? Um, uh, people thought that the majority of Russians shared their opinions about politics, right? which, if you're in the opposition, sort of empirically shouldn't be true, right? Um, and yet that was the, the, the opinions that people were able to have, right? I think as a result of, of having most of their conversations in, again, this probably should sound familiar to most of us living in this country or in the UK, frankly, and thinking about politics as well. Um, but... Um, it's, uh, it's limited. When it comes to, to satire, I would give a shout out to one of my PhD students, actually, who's finishing a, a PhD at the moment on, uh, on political satire in, in, in Putin's Russia. Um, and one of the things, Alina uh, Fyodorova is, is, is her name, one of the things that she finds is that there is a plenty of political satire out there, but it's divorced from the news. 
All right, so there is satire of Putin, there is satire of the Kremlin and, 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 and the ruling uh, circle, right? But it's never linked to the uh, events of the day, right? Um, which softens the edge uh, to, to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. if, if, if I may just add, add something though, I think about, um, in, in, in terms of, there, there, there are plenty of people who are cynical, plenty of people who are skeptical, but, but Crimea is a very interesting and very particular case in which what it, what it does is it gets the Russian state by successfully, very rapidly, uh, annexing Crimea. Um, it gets the Russian state on the same page as lots of other people who've been thinking things for a long time, sincerely and, and, and you know, with, with, with real patriotic fervor. When we, when we find that Crimea doesn't make people more nationalistic, the message to take from that, I think, is that they were pretty darn nationalistic before, right? And there was a lot more support for the annexation of, of, of Crimea, uh, genuine support than we might have have thought. I was actually reading Svetlana Alexeva last night and, and some stuff she wrote in the early 90s and she goes on about Crimea all the time, which was, which was really kind of blew my mind on the, on the flight on the way over here. Um, I think we really underestimated the extent to which this really touched a nerve. It brought together Russian ethnic nationalists. It brought together people who were nostalgic for, for the Soviet Union. Um, it, it, it really, uh, Brought these communities that are often quite separate uh, together, and it, and 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 it brought Putin and, and and people, kind of economic liberals around him, onto that all 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 onto that same page, and, and in a way that in a way that none of us would have, very few of us would have expected. Mm -hmm. I think that's important. Okay. Uh, I'm a social psychologist, uh, and I very much appreciated the uh, <coughs> the effort to discuss. The big five and especially especially agreeableness, uh, paying attention to social context. I think actually you're way ahead of most of the social psychologists uh, in that, and it's very uh, important. Uh, I think one thing, uh, the discussion of cynicism and satire uh, strikes me as important because what has changed is that in the 1990s and the period that I was most familiar with, uh, to be agreeable was to be cynical. Uh, the true believers were laughed at, were scorned, were thought of as being childlike. Has that really changed? That's a question. And what I would invite you to do is to tell us a little bit more about what happens when you start to disaggregate your data. You gave us a very broad brush picture. You didn't distinguish young people from old people. You didn't distinguish people in uh, Moscow and Petersburg from the uh, hinterlands. You didn't uh, distinguish women from men who had very, very different experiences after the fall of the old regime. For women, it was a disaster. For men, they coped. But anyway, I would just, were there any interesting tidbits when you begin to disaggregate the data? Before you answer that, I just want to collect one more because I know he has to run off to class. So. <laughs> Hi, I'm Norman Maymark. I'm a historian. And, you know, both of you have sort of... Um, uh, dismissed in one way or another, as far as I can tell, the sort of notion of political culture and authoritarianism. I mean, you don't want to talk about it. Uh, you know, history, culture, this kind of thing. And I, it just, but yet when you come back to explanations, you know, when you just were talking about the nationalism that came around, around mm -hmm. in Crimea, I, I just can't even imagine doing that without thinking about political culture in Russia. Mm -hmm. And similarly, you were talking, I can't remember exactly what it was, you know, you dismissed kind of notions of culture and, and, and long-term political structures in Russian life, but at the same time then come back to what seems to be, you know, kind of repeated and repetitive patterns. So how, how would you, I mean, I'm not saying right or wrong, I'm just saying how would you then look at political culture? Is this something you just kind of dismiss and throw away and say it doesn't matter that it's Russia? Um, especially when you do something, when you talk about social context, social context, what is social context? I mean, social context in some ways is passed on generation to generation. I mean, how do you create a social context? 
So, um, uh, how do you? Uh, I mean, how do you think about those kinds of questions? Mm -hmm. um, so we'll come That's back to you guys, and then mm -hmm. we'll declare an end at one fifteen. So let me apologize in advance for anyone whose questions we didn't get to. Sure. So just to take these, thank you for your, your kind words about about the uh, the analysis. What, what's really interesting is that when you uh, try and break these results down in, by, by different demographic groups, by Moscow versus Petersburg, by men versus women, there's just not that much interesting stuff there. There may be a slight sort of age curve where older people and younger people tend to be more pro-regime uh, and, 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 and middle-aged people tend to be a little less, but, but it, that really depends on how you control for different things and how you do the analysis. Um, what's really interesting, um, and we also found this sort of, if you look at, at the shift in, in approval that happens around the annexation of Crimea, it's not that there's, there, there's, there's a tiny bit of polarization where a small number of people who were pretty, you know, kind of low on enthusiasm for Putin become even lower. But the rest of the population, the other 95% of the population, just move in kind of lockstep. Uh, and that's what's really interesting is the absence in some sense of that really, really important effects by different demographic group. Um, in terms of, 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 of culture, and, and so I, I'm very nervous about large aggregates like that. Um, there are continuities and, and, and differences. And if, if one of the things that I think is really uh, continuous in this process is the level of patriotism or nationalism or whatever you want to call it, um, that's a really important factor in Russian politics and we ignore that at our peril. Right? Um, on the other hand, the idea that you see, you know, the, the kind of simple Soviet man or the idea of, you know, the strong hand and all of these things that are traditionally, the, the, those ideas are so firmly entrenched in Western thinking about Russia that if you write a book about public opinion, political culture, about, about ideas in Russia, then, then it's, it's incumbent upon you to, to fight against them because they're so misleading. And we, in the book, we kind of go through a bunch of these, these old, old ideas uh, that we don't like. Um, not, not the idea that history matters. Of course, history matters, and of course, context matters. Um, but, 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 but we would try and really be specific and evidence-based about which parts of context matter. Yeah, I think that's right. I think ideally, right, and maybe this is a point that could be made more clearly. But um, uh, if, if if history and and context and culture matter, right, and they clearly do, there still has to be a mechanism through which they matter, right, um, and hopefully. Um, uh, understanding the way that social context then shapes political behavior, right, um, gives us some more purchase on the ways in which, in certain circumstances, um, uh, certain elements of, of, of history are uh, motivating factors or demotivating factors, um, and, and, and others are, are not, right? But it is, um, um, you know, interesting that we don't, um, you know, find some of these um, disaggregated effects, right, that might line up with you know, um, uh, sort of uh, ideas of, of, you know, if you would expect older aspects of political culture maybe to, to, to matter, you would expect the maybe generational cohort uh, effects and that kind of thing that, that we don't find, right? Um, so uh, it does suggest that there is something uh, happening much more in the here and now that is making things that we might associate with Russian political culture or history matter, right? But that there is something present in the in, in the, the agency and the factors shaping agency uh, that, are, that, are making that, um, that are making that matter. Um, I really, um, this is not an answer to the question, but I really like the observation about how agreeableness would have been different in the 90s uh, in terms of what you were agreeing with. I think that's uh, spot on. Uh, and, and we need to, to think about the degree to which that, uh, about why that has changed. I think if I look at the data, look at the interviews, clearly that has changed. Right. Um, it is clearly now um, uncouth for the majority of Russians right, um, to um, uh, express an opinion other than one that is enthusiastic to a degree. You don't want to be overly enthusiastic. Right? Um, but um, uh, exactly why and how that has changed is a, um, is a question I think needs more research. Um, all right. Uh, you had one last, you had your hand up quickly. I guess we can take it. We have two minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Pass this around. Yeah. 
Okay, well, looking at the graph, um, one thing that occurred to me, it seems to me that it looks like there's a hard core of people who, are su who support Putin and a hard core of people who oppose Putin. Who are these people? We were talking about this. You have, here. <laughs> so you have Trumpians and anti-Trumpians. I mean, who are they? Twenty percent. Moved around. Yeah. So the the hardcore are people who uh, um, are the so so I, 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 so I'm struggling because of this word hardcore, right? Um, there is a consistent majority who perceive it to be in their interest to be supportive of Putin. If there's a hardcore, then those, that hardcore people are, are conservatives. Right? People who, especially in the, in the, since 2011, who are, you know, in our parlance, high on conscientiousness. People who actually believe in order, who, who thinks Putin has brought order to Russia, um, and who, who you know, believe that any deviation from that order is a major mistake. Another big part of that 60%, though, are, 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 are I would think of as being more conditional. That's why I struggle with the word hardcore. They're there because the social consensus is that's where we are. But under a different social consensus, they would be somewhere else. Right? Um, and then in terms of the opposition, it's, it's really, you know, it's, it's, it's a combination. I mean, this is not based on, on, on the numbers are small enough that it's, that it's hard to, to, to really study systematically, but they're... Um, a combination of uh, liberals, economic liberals, pro-Westerners. Um, they also include um, people on the hard left, uh, Bolsheviks, revolutionaries, those, those, those kinds of people. Um, and, you know, uh, their, uh, their, their numbers are, are, are small, but, but they're at least as anti-Putin now as they, ever, as they ever have been. But it's maybe, it's not much more than, you know, 10, 15% of the population. No, I, I, mean, I, I think that's right, but I think that one of the things that's fascinating about this, right, and, for, and, and maddening about it at the same time, and one of the reasons we had ended up turning to other things, other non-material factors in, in explaining this, um, is that um, the things that we think of as lining up with sort of uh, you know, political distributions um, don't work, right? Um, so there aren't um, geographical elements to this. There is a slight differentiation between Moscow, St. Petersburg, and the rest of the country, but it's not actually quite as much as you would think, uh, particularly when, if you're focusing on large cities. There is a, a bit of an urban rural divide, but um, there uh, is not a class divide, right? There is not a, 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 a hard um, educational uh, divide. What it seems to come down to is um, uh, socialization, right? Um, through media consumption, right? Because we consume media for the purpose of being able to talk with other people in our social circle about what we're consuming, right? Um, so who you talk to and what they read then shapes what you read and what you talk about and how you feel about it, right? And, and most people like to be in sync politically, emotionally, and otherwise with their social circles. Otherwise we feel um, uh, um, uncomfortable, right? Um, and so uh, what seems to be shaping this, right, um, is, um, is people's patterns of socialization, right, uh, disconnected from socioeconomic factors, geographical factors, other sort of more structural factors, right, that will drive some people to the left and some people uh, to the right. So even things like conservatism, I think that's true, right, that the bulk of these people would think of themselves as conservative, and they are, and we could place them on that spectrum. But there are plenty of other conservative, in some cases even more conservative, candidates on the political spectrum in Russia than Putin, right? Um, but this is a question about approval for, for Putin, right? So it should be, in theory, perfectly possible, right, for somebody to look and say, actually, I'd much rather have Zyuganov or Zhirinovsky or one of these other people, right, um, because uh, they're not, they're pushing for, a, 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 you know, a stronger um, uh, uh, ties to, to, to the Russian Orthodox Church, right? They're, they're more wedded to sort of core traditional ethnic Russian values. Putin is, for, you know, for all his faults, not an ethnic nationalist, right? Um, uh, that uh, they're more clearly actually, you know, uh, harking back to a Soviet past that I might feel is important to me, right? So there are lots of other directions that these same people could turn other than Putin. I think the only satisfying explanation for why they don't turn to those other people than Putin is that they are looking not just at their one-on-one -on -one relationship with Putin, but they're looking at how their relationship with Putin structures their relationships with all of the people who are much more proximate and matter to, to them much more in their lives, their relatives, their friends, their co-workers, and so on.
They can, even in rankings, they, they tend to put Putin first though, right? Much higher yeah. than the others. All right, well, our time has uh, actually, we've even run over time. So um, thank you guys very much. And thank you audience for your great questions. And um, 